love that sets us free. There is only love. Oh, there's only love because there's only God. Let there be only God in our focus this moment. Yes, there's stuff going on out there and there's things that'll happen this afternoon and mm, besides that, did I really, did I pick up everything I needed at the grocery store? There's all this stuff going on and yet for this hour, let us focus on something greater than ourselves, and greater than our concerns and greater than our, oh, our ideas and all those things that try to distract us from being in this moment and let us sink into the idea that the highest name for this thing that we can call God is love. And to know God is to know love and to know love is to know an expression of the infinite. Thank you, sweet spirit, for bringing us here, gathering us in consciousness, whether we are in this room or we are in someone else's room. Thank you for the connection and let us know that because there's truly only love. And so it is. So the theme for this uh, month is um, establishing establishing conscious community. And I'm sitting down because I want us to have a talk. Do you know that there's five words that men hate? <laughs> Honey, we need to talk. <laughs> That's what I heard. I, I don't know. Because <laughs> I'm the one saying it. I didn't know they hated it. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I want to talk about this establishing conscious community thing. Last week, I started out with a quote by Brene Brown, and it is, connection is why we are here. We are hardwired to connect with others. That's what gives us purpose and meaning. Without it, there is suffering. Now, uh, how many of you know Brene Brown? She's a, so yes, a sociologist, a professor, and she does research. She's a clinical researcher also in this idea of how people connect and how they interact with each other. So I'm reading a book of hers called Daring Greatly, which is the result of about nine years of study, clinical study, lots of interviews, lots of putting the ideas together. And um, what she found is, is that we're, we are... We are geared towards connection, but we're not. Have you noticed that we're just starting to get more and more fragmented? And what she came up with in her study is that the thing that keeps people wanting to separate, wanting to disconnect, wanting to protect themselves is a deep-seated experience in our culture of shame. And shame shows up as there's something wrong with me, I'm not worthy of this. I'm just not enough. How many of you have had the thought, I'm not enough in something? I'm not thin enough, old enough, young enough, experienced enough, educated enough, blah, 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 blah. Or how many of you have just had this idea that somehow you would like to have more good stuff, but you're just not worthy of it? You know, she actually studied people. I love this. She studied how sometimes shame shows up, and it is... Um, the, the idea that when something so good is happening in your life, like you just have a grandchild, or you just, had, you just got a promotion, or you just met the honey of your life, or whatever, or you got the divorce you've always wanted. You, know? <laughs> you finally got the, the, the house, you finally got the blah, 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 the new car, whatever, that there is actually something that she found that people go through, which is this is too good to continue, the other shoe's about to drop. That's a phenomenon. I thought it was just me. It's actually in the culture because we're not worthy to have good and keep good. 
I mean, that's in the culture. There are some people that don't buy into that as much who actually overcome this idea of shame, and she calls them wholehearted people. Wholehearted. They're, they're living from their heart. More about that in a minute. But anyway, so I, I gave that talk a, a talk on this because I'm just like, wow, this is so us as a culture. I don't know about you individually, but what I'm reading on reading about and, and just hearing people's stories, I go, wow, this is true. And so I came up with a hack, a spiritual hack, and I gave it last week. And the spiritual hack is to just, just listen to this, just, all, just, just, that sounds like my grandmother when she was trying to teach me to cook, just a little salt. It's like, well, how much is just a little salt? Anyway, just court God. Court the presence of something greater than yourself. And actually, when you do, you connect with that something greater than yourself. And then that something greater than it's yourself ignites within you the memory of your own worthiness and innocence and, and uh, enoughness. It is hard to be in God's presence. Like we're always in God's presence, but it's hard to be conscious of that connection and feel unworthy. So if I was working with anybody, I would get them back to that, and then we would start to work. Because there, when we are conscious of that presence, there's no arguing about how bad we are and how it won't work out. That stuff dissolves. How many of you have had that experience? You, you meet up with something different. I'd like at least one hand. I mean, this is the Center for Spiritual Living. Somebody's done their spiritual work. Jeffrey May, if you don't raise your hand, your license is going away. I mean it. <laughs> I mean, we had these, haven't we? But the thing of it is, is that sometimes we have them, and then there's these long stretches in between having them again. And that's when we fall into the cultural consciousness, I'll call it, of not enough. Not enough anything. Like, I'm not, in, I'm not enough of this or that. She actually says that, that what is, is feeding shame is the consciousness of scarcity. Scarcity. I haven't arrived yet. I'm not there yet. So, what I, uh, I realized that that yes, I, I want to facilitate within myself and my family and my friends and my center, I want to facilitate the experience of the connection with the infinite so that limited ideas of myself and, and my world dissolve. I want to do that. But I also want us to create a spiritual infrastructure so that as we are progressing on this road of life and we're going from it's just little old me to God is showing up as me, there's a progression that we don't fall off into this downward spiral of I can't do it, I won't be able to do it, I'm all by myself. The talk title for today is, You Were Not Made to Go It Alone. And yet, when people get into trauma and drama, they, they, they separate and they go it alone. I have seen and met so many people who come back to the center after a while, and I hear the same story over and over again. I was having a hard time, and I had to just be by myself. which according to Brene Brown is the last thing you need. When you're going through things, what you need is the uplift of consciousness of others. How many of you that have been here for a while, or especially back when we were really full steam before COVID, would have like a low vibration, drag yourself to church, I'm gonna go, Told him I'd usher. <laughs> I probably don't need me anyway. I'm going to get my bad mood all over everybody. 
be best if I stayed home. Okay. I tell him I'm not going to go. I'll just sit in the back and seethe. And then all of a sudden you're in the room and you leave different. How many have had that experience? That's what collective consciousness does. You didn't do anything. You just rode the wave. That's the infrastructure, spiritual infrastructure that we can be supported by, which is what I want to cultivate. So I want to talk to you about some, some don'ts and some do's. Do's and don'ts. Now these are not, these are not big, I think this is not like do this and go to hell. Or don't do this and go to hell. I mean, this, I'm just saying that this isn't like some sort of God told me to tell you that if you cross this line, you're in trouble. We don't do that. But these are suggestions for living in such a way that the culture that we're creating is an infrastructure of rising consciousness. And of course, you don't have to do them. But you'll feel better, and the community will do better if you do them. These have all come out of um, my doing what I do best, which is uh, retreats. I do retreats, and then I just fill in time until the next retreat. <laughs> you know, and I, I act as a CEO, and I do talks and, and teach classes. But what I do really well is, is in a, a, a small area, something happens so that people come in one way and leave another. And I have d developed the way that I do it. And I don't even do it. I just facilitate it. I just create the infrastructure. And then our sacred covenant does the work. The covenant with God does the work, and we just create the structure. So um, the, a lot of this learning came out of doing retreats, especially travel retreats, and just watching how people are and noticing if it didn't work and why it didn't work and making sure I'd never do that again. So the first don't we have came out of my trip to Kenya in uh, 1995. Um, and that don't is... Thank you. Somebody knew it. Don't complain. It came out of my having a really miserable trip at a really wonderful place the year before and noticing that it came out of a lot of different groups with different opinions kind of clashing together. So I said, oh, if I do another trip, international trip, I'll only take my group because my group, you know, I, don't I sound like a mama? My group would get along. Uh-huh. And so we went to Kenya. <laughs> and in uh, Kenya, it was, you know, we went to Safari. It was, here, here's how you get used to stuff. We saw our first giraffe. <gasps> I, I mean, what? It's a giraffe. Look, look at it. Right on the side of the road. It's a giraffe. Ten days later. Giraffe. Anyway, so. But the deal that I want to talk about with, with the complaining is that it was, you know, 28 years ago or so. And... Um, they were still of the opinion that when people came from the United States, they were meat eaters. So we ha would have like four to five different kinds of meat and not a lot of other stuff. And we had three vegetarians on the trip. And we are on safari, so we're out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, they have to roll in food and roll it out. And the people that were vegetarians weren't able to eat a lot because they were strict except for salads and french fries, really good french fries. But uh, <laughs> because that's all they had to eat, they started to complain. And pretty soon, it was just like that was what we do, is in between looking at elephants and lions and, and giraffes and wildebeests, we complained. And it just brought the whole group down. 
we were in paradise and everyone was so miserable that the people that were going on for another five days to Tanzania, they just wanted to go home. Can they just go home? Can we just change our ticket and go home? Because it wasn't any fun. Complaining is no fun and it pollutes the atmosphere. So from then on, every trip had don't complain. And I've noticed that it really did shift things. But there's more, there's more. I've come up with more. The next one is don't compare. <sighs> and I compared. I have compared. Comparing means don't rank an order of good and bad. Now, if you're going to go and buy tennis shoes, compare which shoes feel best on your feet. But we have a tendency to compare and rank order. You're not as good as this. That's not as good as that. That's, uh, it was better last time. I liked, I have to say this when we go to Seabec because people will have a great experience at Seabec, our church camp, but it won't be the same this year because people are shifting. Things are shifting. We can't, we will not enjoy it if what we've done is compare everything to the time we had before. This is important in relationships. Do not compare your current relationship to the person that you thought you married. Because hopefully they've changed and you've changed. And to go back and say you used to be this way is not a recipe for happiness. And I've done this. I've done this. I... I've um, taught a, a, a class called Inward Journey for a number of years. And I think it was about my fifth year that I got the perfect class for me. The perfect class. Because Glee was on TV. <laughs> and somebody would say something and somebody would think of a song that went with it and we would burst into song. And Ray Huell and Debbie Esposito were in class, and they were both dancers. And they would go into the middle, because we would be in a circle, and they'd go into the middle of class, and they would dance. And then we'd start to dance, and we'd be singing, and then we'd get back to our lesson. I was in heaven, heaven. The next year, they didn't sing and they didn't dance. And when I would burst into song, they'd look at me like I was really crazy and stupid. <laughs> Now, I took a lot of months for me to stop comparing the new class with the old class so that I could enjoy the new class. Comparing leads us to complaining, and it also leads us to the thing that we're also, I suggest we do not do if we want to build a community that is an infrastructure of healing, and that is don't criticize. Don't criticize. To criticize means that you are finding something bad and you are judging it as wrong. It doesn't mean that you go along with everything, but I know that in your heart of hearts you know what it's like to say, no, I don't want to do that, and then also know what it feels like to criticize that. Criticism affects the person doing it, and it affects the person receiving it. And it seems like we are really in criti criticizing mode lately. Like, weird. Um, I, I, I'm on a bunch of web uh, Facebook sites, and a lot of them have to do with horses. And so there's this gentleman who wanted to lease out part of his stables, and he was trying to tell people that he had room at his stable. And he was probably using um, voice text because there was no commas. He just, he just started saying things, and it made sense while he said it, but when it printed out, it was uh, tack room office, four horse bathroom. And I just couldn't stand it. I had to say, wow, how'd you get the horses in the bathroom and train them to go there? <laughs> a little snippy. But I really, I meant it as a joke. I thought he'd find it as a joke. And some woman landed on me and told me how unkind I was. And I was like, wow, OK. OK. 
This is important because we need to know the difference. We need to know how, how not to do things so that we can allow ourselves to move into the next things that I want to talk about, which is good communication. That we, that we truly look at, can I not compare so that I don't criticize so that I'm not complaining? and yet we still can communicate. See, if I tell somebody something that needs to happen, but I don't come from a critical, complaining attitude, it's going to be easier for them to hear it. I need to fire my farrier. That's somebody that does horsey pedicures. And um, I need to do that because every time he works on my horse, she goes lame. And I love him. He's a good man but he's not right for my horse. So I need to just say that in such a way and, and be courageous to, to courageous, take the time to find that innocence and goodness within myself so that I can convey to him how much I like him, but he's not appropriate for my horse. Now, why is this important? Why do we want to create this, um, and I'm, before I I'm tell you the do's, you got the three don'ts? The, it's however you do it. This is why we need to do this, because if that's going on in the culture, if that's going on in your family, if that's going on in your office, if there's a lot of of uh, complaining and criticism and comparing to that. It, it just weighs things down and people don't feel safe in evolving their spiritual self. They don't feel safe enough. There's no infrastructure for development, so what they do then is they remove themselves. I'll get, you know, when I get strong, I'll come back. This is what Brene Biron says. Over the past decade, I have witnessed major shifts in the culture of our country. I've seen it in the data, and honestly, I've seen it in the faces of the people I meet, interview, and talk to. The world has never been an easy place, but the past decade has been traumatic for so many people that it's, that it's made changes in our consciousness. From 9-11, multiple wars, the recession, to catastrophic natural disasters, and the increase in random violence and school shootings, we've survived and are surviving events that have torn at our sense of safety with such force that we've experienced them as trauma, even if we weren't directly involved. And when it comes to the staggering number of people who are now unemployed or underemployed, I think that every single one of us has been directly affected or is close to someone who's been directly affected by one of these things. Worrying about scarcity is our culture's version of post-traumatic stress syndrome. It happens when we've been through too much and rather than coming together to heal, which requires us to be vulnerable, we get angry, scared, and at each other's throats. Do you see that? I, don't, do you see that in, in, on Facebook and news and, and throwing blame, shame, and regret at other people? And it's because we're stressed. And according to Brene, one of the best ways to get over that is to lean into a community, whether it's their family or a small group of friends or your work environment or a center like this. So by eliminating our complaining, our comparing, and our criticizing, we start to let go of the stuff that the soul senses and starts to get defensive about. Because even if it's not said, I've noticed that even if I do not criticize out loud, it does something to me when I'm criticizing in my mind. And I would imagine that it is 
broadcast out from me. So what do we do if we're not doing those things? <laughs> you know, if you, if you let those three things go, what do you start to do? You start to care. We have so much in common, and we're all in this together. And we care because we all want good stuff. What we have in common is we all want good stuff. And we all want our own good stuff. I don't want your good stuff. You do not want my good stuff. But I, I know what it's, want, what it's like to want something good, and so I know how I want to support you and you having your good. Because then we have an atmosphere of, wow, it's okay to want a greater life, a more expressive, free, creative, purposeful life. So we care. And then we contribute. What can we do to ease the burden of others? What can we do to celebrate their wins? What can we do to hold them up when it's hard for them to stand up on their own? How can we contribute? How do we make our family, our work environment, our, our spiritual center better? What is ours to do? What is ours to contribute? I, I think, I'm not sure if it was the last trip or the trip before to Egypt. One of the women broke her, broke, I don't know, this arm up here, whatever this is called, on like the second day. And there were 12 more to go. She couldn't do, she couldn't take her bags. I mean, we were all pitching in because we wanted her to have a great experience. It wouldn't have been fun if she was sitting on the boat and couldn't go with places with us. So she was held figuratively and, and, and literally by the group so that she could make all of the monuments and take in all the scenery and go to all the events. You contribute. You care, you contribute, and then you connect. You seek out people that you have not known before because they might have something wonderful to say to you or you would be just the person that needs to say the right thing to them. You connect. And sometimes that takes courage. I am a recovering shy, shy per person. So for me to go up to someone I do not know, I just have to take a deep breath. Now it's, you know, I, I doesn't, do I seem shy to you right now? No, no. but you're back there. Look at the space I've got. <laughs> I could do all sorts of things. But I'm not sure I, I would feel the same if we were really close and we were getting intimate. I mean, I really have to suck it up and, and move past my desire to, to isolate. But in the connection, I've never felt like I lost. I always feel like I win. So to honestly do that, it helps to weave the consciousness that we all get to create together, whether it's in our family, our work environment, or our spiritual community. And then what you get to experience is camaraderie, community, and a confirmation that you are enough that we are enough, you are enough. And, and you get to experience that, not just be told that, but experience it. Every time we go past what we think we could do, we experience more of our true self. And that true self is, is the ancient of days. It's called the ancient of days in the Bible. It means we've been around for a long time. We, this is not our first rodeo, kids. We've been around and we discover that the more we participate and we allow a community to support us. So I, I'm gonna, we're going to end differently today. Joel's going to join me. Oh, and Jules. Yeah, come on up. Let's see a little choir. Who's also come, come on right over here. Yeah, just get you. Yeah, see, this is a, yeah, you're going to contribute. This is good. I like. 
I, I love being bossy. There you go. Let's see, who else is in the choir? Who loves to sing? Okay, oh yeah, Cal, come on. Trish is in the choir? Oh, Trish, come on up. Oh, Trish was trying to d duck down, but no, she's up now. And, yes, come on, Chad's. Chad, yeah, come on over here. Just spread out because we want to we want to get it all over everybody. Some, some, I bet Al knows this song. You may not know this song, but uh, Chad probably knows it. This song is, was sung a lot by uh, Ricky Byers because she said it was such a great song. She didn't write it, but she, if, if you're around her for very long, you're going to be singing it with her. And the whole idea is, is that when we know who we are, then we get to love who are, we are. To know, know, know you is to love, love, love you. Well, to know, know, know yourself is to love, love, love yourself. It really is where it starts. It really is where it starts. And you can take your masks off if you're back this far back, by the way, so that people can hear you, because you're going to help me sing. I, 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 I did solo first service. That was my act of courage. But I've decided I don't need to do that ever again. <laughs> I don't need to lead a sing-along. So it goes like this, I love myself so much, because if I love myself so much, then it just moves out, and if I'm loving me, if I'm really loving me, then there's only one thing I can do, and that is to love you, and you, and you, and you, and then the you gets even bigger and bigger. It's not just my family and my friends and those people who like me, oh hell no, oh no. That's a very small group, those people who like me. No, I am going to take those people, even that I don't know, and the love just expands and ropes in, and it's just, you get to feel what it's like to be the divine because love is just flowing out, and then it's touching other people, and those people are feeling it, and it's like, oh, I'm loved, I'm loved, and then they start to love themselves. That's what community does. And then they love themselves, and then guess what? Then they love you back. And then it just starts like this. This is what a spiritual community is all about. It goes like this. <laughs> I love myself so much that I can love you so much. That you can love you so much That you can start loving me And there's hand motions I love myself so much That I can love you so much That you can love you so much That you can start loving me I love myself so much that I can love you so much That you can love you so much That you can start loving me Now as a prayer, as a prayer, as a prayer So, so much That I can love